Aldron, and I work here at the Kelly Community Foundation. I want to welcome everybody here for a very important subject. It's not always easy to have these conversations, but we feel that it's important. We've been asked by some of our best partners here with the Detroit FBI Field Office, Warren Consolidated Schools, and the Sterling Heights Police Department, and one of our own from the Kelly Community Foundation, one of our therapists. Calvary Community Foundation services nearly 35,000 people a year for social services, such as immigration, career services, ESL, citizenship, workforce development, early childhood education. We also have a partnership with Accenture for a primary care center on site, as well as a mental health facility with trilingual therapists, which keep everything confidential always. I'm excited today to have this conversation. It's something that we should all be doing as parents, friends, families. The internet is around all of us. Sometimes we don't always know who's in the internet. We always know about the person who's a danger outside of our home, but sometimes it's hard to find out the danger that's in our kids' computers. At this time, I'd like to welcome Special Agent in Charge of the Detroit Field Office, Special Agent Timothy Waters. Good evening, I'm uh, Tim Waters. I'm a Special Agent in Charge here for the FBI in the state of Michigan. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Paul and the uh, Caledonian Community Foundation for the opportunity to be here tonight to speak about this very difficult and sensitive topic. But I believe it's important to have these difficult conversations now so, so that none of you end up as a victim as, of, of this crime down the road. It's important for young people and their caregivers to understand that predators can victimize children and teens in their own homes through devices they use for gaming, for homework, to communicate with your friends. And although it may be easy to blame a victim for, for a certain predicament, we are talking about children being manipulated by professionals, professional predators who have perfected their craft. Before they know it, young people can be in over their heads and be too scared to, to talk to anybody about what's going on. Tonight's event is designed to inform students of this crime so they know how to avoid risky situations online and know how to ask for help if they are being victimized. It is also designed to equip parents and caregivers with tools to help prevent young people in their lives from becoming victims and to give them resources to help if they already have them. Again, I wanna thank the Calvin Community Foundation and, and especially my FBI Community Outreach Specialist, Mary Abishud, for all the hard work that all of you have done to put, put this event on tonight. I look forward to our continued cooperation and working with the community to keep everyone safe. Thank you so much. I'm now going to introduce uh, Community Outreach Specialist, Mary Abishud. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this very important informative session. Um, we intend for this program to provide tools and information for parents and caregivers to keep children safe. Open dialogue between parents and caregivers and their children are quite critical at this time because children have a constant online presence for a number of reasons which we will discuss. The panelists with us this evening include Rick Schultz from Warren Consolidated Schools, he is the Director of Security and Crisis Management, Detective Lisa Pappas from the Sterling Heights Police Department, Special Agent Adam Christensen from the Detroit FBI Field Office, Victim Specialist Melissa Novak from the FBI Detroit Field Office, and Social Worker with the Chaldean Community Foundation, Jackie Raster. The panelists here are going to share their collective experiences in keeping and protecting children safe from being manipulated by a predator online. We recognize that this is a deeply sensitive and uncomfortable conversation, but as law enforcement, we want to provide parents and caregivers with information that could help protect your children. With that, I'm going to begin the program with, with Rick Schultz and um, asking questions regarding why children are spending so much time as it relates to war and consolidated school districts. Well, thank you, Mary. And uh, thank you, the Calhoun Community Foundation, for having me. 
maybe. Um, obviously, I think you know we have been in a direction where uh, not just children, but just uh, people overall have been using you know, communication devices and, and computers and internet more and more uh, frequently. Uh, the new, newest catalyst has been the pandemic, which has really forced um, our kids, even from kindergarten up, uh, into more exposure onto computers and, and the internet. Uh, so, you know, one of the things we, they are spending more time being more comfortable with the computer system because they're on them uh, almost daily. Um, another reason why, uh, you know, their, their increase is uh, with the pandemic, uh, the only way you could uh, visit friends was, was through the internet and uh, certain platforms. So uh, our youth got very comfortable using all these platforms and, and it became more of a, uh, a, a social, uh, their social life instead of face to face became used with the computers and phones and, and, their, and even if parents don't understand or not, they have multiple ways, laptops, computers, uh, iPads, telephones, uh, cell phones rather, there's lots of ways that they can uh, they can use yeah. uh, phones to to uh, get the right outcome with how to communicate. What does the district teaching students about internet safety? Uh, more consolidated schools. I'm uh, very proud to say that we have uh, several uh, policies and programs in place. Um, one of them that we have on, online on our website is the uh, the online safety uh, at home a guide for keeping the child safe. And that's something that any of our uh, parents can go on to and research and, and read uh, uh, some valuable information and some uh, suggestions on how to keep your, your child safe when they, when they are on the internet. Um, but most importantly, um, our district uh, superintendent, Dr. Robert Livernoy, uh, started a uh, curriculum-based initiative about seven years ago uh, called uh, Cyber Ethics. And what that is, is it's a comprehensive uh, curriculum taught in our schools uh, that is age appropriate. And it starts at, at kindergarten and it increasingly goes up with their maturity and their levels of working on computers and, and internet as they get older. So it's as simple as basically, you know, stranger danger for, for young kids and, and that not just strangers out on the street, there's strangers behind, behind the computers. And all the way up to, uh, you know, high school seniors where they're gonna be starting to get jobs and, and uh, going to college and, and some background checks are gonna be done on them. And when, you know, we tell them when you, when you post it, online doesn't go away. So uh, that's a real important program that we have uh, with uh, Lamar Consolidated Schools and, and teaching the kids to take personal responsibility for what they do on the internet. What is expected of parents while their children are online from all ages? What we, what we see is it's, it's, it's very tough, um, it's a tough transition for kids and parents uh, when we move from the, from the pandemic era to education online. The, the, the biggest thing we try to stress to parents is that uh, just monitor your children as much as you can. Um, make sure, you know, they're gonna get a lot of information from a lot of other, other kids and peers about platforms. Make sure that you're not, if your child has to be on a platform or they can have an account on a certain platform, make sure that it's age appropriate for that child. That's the most important thing. Um, so if you have younger kids trying to get on to Facebook and, and other, other platforms are going to go at that age. So we basically just stress that they really need to monitor what they're doing and, and don't be afraid to, to ask questions with your, with your child and explain explain them and have open dialogue with, you know, you know about stranger, the stranger danger on the internet. Thank you so much. Detective Pappas, what are you seeing at the local level as it relates to internet safety? Thank you, Mary. Um, and I want to thank the Chaldean Community Foundation uh, for hosting this event, which I find to be um, super helpful, hopefully, for you all at home. Um, what we're seeing on the local level in Sterling Heights is, as Rick said, um, a huge increase in internet crimes involving children, um, particularly on specific apps uh, like Snapchat, TikTok, um, Instagram. Uh, a lot of these platforms have changed uh, their interface and allow video messaging, um, and there's a lot of parental settings, and people aren't always aware of the capabilities that can be done to support kids to be on there safely. Um, and so what we're seeing is with children having to be on electronics through school, they're having a lot more exposure, um, a lot more conversations with other children, um, and that knowledge is traveling uh, rapidly for kids on how they can hide the 
things from their parents um, and you know do different apps where the parents don't see what they're doing um, and so we find that it's just a huge increase over COVID um, over the fact that technology is rapidly rising access for these types of things in kids is huge um, most of us as parents we didn't have cell phones uh, at our disposal when we were growing up our kids have had them since birth um, and they're way more <laughs> tech savvy than we are um, and so that's been quite a hurdle um, and a little bit of a learning curve for some of our parents and residents um, who are trying to help their kids navigate through uh, such a widely um, exposed time of technology. Do you have any specific recommendations that you would provide parents with in regards to internet safety for their children? I do um, and specifically in regards to our residents here in Sterling Heights um, on behalf of the department, we strongly encourage residents to um, reach out to us, whether it be to make a report if they are uncomfortable with something that they've noticed their child doing, or even if they want to just speak with us about um, some concerns that they have, and we can help them on a private level um, with uh, engaging some of the safety controls that cell phones have, um, engaging some of the safety um, technology that certain apps have specifically. So uh, my recommendation is for you to reach out to us um, because we're the ones that can help you. So uh, we're more than happy to um, have you come into the station. We will come out to your house, um, but we are super equipped to uh, assist you in navigating um, the technology that, that most of us, even us here, <laughs> didn't always know, and it's, it's changing every day. Um, so on behalf of the department, you know, we strongly uh, encourage you to reach out to us um, for assistance at any time. Special Agent Christensen, what risk do children face online while having a social presence? Oh, great. So uh, people have already talked about uh, the presence. Uh, basically, when, when you have an open connection to the world through the internet, you're inviting basically anyone on the internet into your home. So you're allowing access to everyone in your home to uh, people who potentially could cause them harm. Uh, you know, as people have stressed previously, there are plenty of uh, good activities. Uh, the internet is important for everyone in today's society. It uh, allows access to friends and family and information. But um, we've seen increasingly, as, as Lindsay mentioned, uh, that people use that access to uh, prey on children. So they're getting, um, they know where children are um, <coughs> getting online, the different apps, the different games that they use, and they'll use uh, techniques and variety of ways to gain access to them and then um, potentially uh, try to get them to send inappropriate images of themselves to, to them. And what happens when um, those inappropriate images are obtained by a predator online? So oftentimes we see, and uh, in, in what we're kind of talking about tonight, is the, this crime called sextortion. Um, so a lot of these the guys who are interested in these images of children uh, they'll use that as leverage to get more and more of, of those images from from the children. So they get uh, it doesn't even have to be a completely sexual uh, photo. They'll just get something that's a little risque, and depending on the culture that the person might be a part of, that might just be embarrassing to them or their family or um, their parents. And they'll use that as a tool for to get them to increase to uh, do further things to get further videos and images and have them sent and to also instruct the children in ways to hide that from uh, the parents and the adults that are around them in their life. And what are some of the popular apps that children are using that put them at risk for that type of exposure specifically? So, so Lindsay mentioned quite a few that are popular, obviously Snapchat, uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook, um, but we see, you know, now Roblox and uh, Minecraft are uh, two game, video games that a lot of children are, are playing, and that's a, a younger age bracket. Um, and, and there's a myriad of different ways that people can communicate online. Uh, so like I said, typically we see um, the people who are trying to gain access to children to get these pictures use like a, a kind of a normal app that you would you think nothing of your child having. And once they have uh, kind of control over the child, they'll take it to a different application that is more hidden um, so that they don't have to um, uh, direct the child to again, hide it from those uh, in their life that would want to help them. What tactics do these perpetrators use to entice children or threaten them with these images? So 
Right, so um, typically you see they start by befriending the children. Uh, they'll, they'll try, they'll literally just play the game with them and uh, see their interests. Um, these guys are, are professionals, a lot, or a lot of them are professionals. This is their, effectively their full-time job. This is their main interest in life and they're gonna take all the time they need to direct them. So they will, uh, and they'll, they'll communicate and befriend the person and then um, and just kind of little by little reel them in to uh, get, to get the, you know, do a little comment that might be a little sexual in nature, see how the child reacts. And they're also targeting particularly the children that are, um, you know, have, have lower defenses, have, you know, don't have the social capabilities or friend, as many friends um, in, in, uh, in person, and that they'll try to get those, target those, or they, they're depressed particular. Um, so they look, they know who to target um, and, and uh, who's kind of weak as far as that, that goes. Is sextortion a rising threat? And if so, who's most targeted? Yeah, so it's definitely, uh, as, as the internet proliferates throughout the world, uh, sextortion has increased, uh, you know, exponentially. Um, so I, I would say, you know, the typical uh, victim is, is any child, you know, that's on the internet, you know, down to, from six years old uh, up, and most, I can't imagine uh, when someone six years, less than six getting that. You know, typically we see it, uh, the primary victims are, are female or are girls, um, but there are definitely uh, individuals that prefer to target boys as well. Um, and, and again, boys' uh, online behavior is a little, often a little more risque, so they, they might be easier targets for the, the subjects who are interested in that. Um, they, their defenses are not as high, and often because we haven't communicated with them about the risks as much either. So I, I don't want to say girls or boys are particularly um, more at risk than the other, but um, yeah, they, they have different risk uh, profiles. What is what is the greatest risk of a child that's being uh, victimized as, by extortion? Uh, so I, I would say it's just uh, the greatest risk comes when they just feel like they have, have absolutely no one to speak to. Um, the, the only way that, that the children really can get out of of, um, of this situation is if they can speak to, uh, you know, hopefully a parent or an adult that they, they trust, um, and, and that person can kind of short circuit uh, the cycle to get out. Um, you know, unfortunately, I've, I've worked with uh, numerous parents who, who the child end up, you know, um, killing themselves. So that is a definite potentiality uh, for, for children who just feel absolutely stuck and don't have a way out of the situation. So I, I would say out of everything we can, we can communicate tonight, the only way out is having an open communication channel between you and your child, either either if you're a parent or a teacher or a trusted adult. Uh, having open communication with children um, is it really the only way to stop this. What suggestions do you have uh, for parents about speaking to their child about being safe online? Uh, I, I would say just having that uh, constant open communication over time uh, to see you know what they're doing online, what kind of apps they're doing, um, just really reiterating to them over time that um, if something says somebody says something to them online that makes them uncomfortable, it's best to just communicate that with the parent. Um, so I would say just it, it's just a matter of you know constant over time communication. What should a parent do if they suspect their child is being um, targeted or victimized in any way? Uh, I, I would say contact law enforcement. So whatever law enforcement you feel most comfortable contacting, whether that's local, uh, the, the, the Sterling Heights Police Department, or coming to us at the FBI. Um, we have a tip line, the 1-800-CALL-FBI, that people are more than welcome to call in tips. And that's really the fastest way to get information to people like me throughout the country. Um, you know, obviously, uh, local law enforcement has a lot of uh, work to do. <laughs> There's just a lot of work to go around everywhere. But a lot of these situations, the uh, subject is not, you know, not in the same city, not in the same state, maybe not even the same country. Um, we see consistently uh, subjects all over the world targeting uh, Americans because that's the victims we're going to see. But Americans are. Uh, 
children seem to be more online than any other children, and so they, uh, you know, they tend to have they tend to have a higher proportion of victims as far as that goes. What should parents not do if they find images on their child's electronic device? So I, I would say if, if if you are going to report to law enforcement, which I would strongly encourage you to do, because um, you're not just the person is not just targeting your child; they're targeting many children. It's very rare for a subject to only target one particular child. Um, so say, you know, don't delete it. The impulse is there. It's going to be incredible for you to just get rid of those images, to get rid of the chats with the guy. Tell him, you know, we see constantly parents get on and tell the guy, you know, you know this is my child. Leave him alone. Don't ever talk to him again. Um, that impulse is incredible. I, you know, that's protection of your child, and I can completely see where people are coming from as far as that goes. But if you, if you think about it, if you can control yourself, I would say save it, um, don't delete it, uh, bring it into law enforcement, because that's gonna be the evidence that we can not only help your child, but many children, because uh, we want to get as many of these people uh, as soon as we possibly can. Could you share some information on what the FBI has done to combat sexual exploitation and enticement of children? Uh, so, uh, my, the task force I work with, as well as uh, agents throughout throughout Michigan and Detroit office, as well as you know uh, agents throughout throughout the country, um, are, are working. Uh, we we get we get tips, we get complaints about about these things, but we also take proactive steps as far as um, doing things online to try to find identities of, of these subjects, to try to you know get get identification of who they are and uh, who, who's targeting children to um, you know. Find them and then arrest them. How is uh, sex torsion different from child sexual exploitation? Uh, so I would say you know, sex extortion is uh, one subset, of some subset of, of child sexual exploitation. So it's it's generally it starts with child sexual exploitation, and that's where some of the subjects will stop. They'll they'll get a child to produce the images that they they want. And then they they'll move on to the next child, and, and we see that with uh, quite a few subjects. But the subjects who are in, involved in, in sex extortion, they get um, they get a thrill out of control of others. So they want the control of, of the child uh, to tell them what to do and when to do it. Um, and so they use that uh, leverage that they have on the child to um, to get to get the images and videos that they're desires of. Um, so that's really just um, just the level of uh, uh, say depravity of the subjects is, is even worse with sextortion versus the other uh, kind of what we're talking about there. Who assists you in speaking with a family on um, or in regards to a child that's been exploited? Yeah, so we, we have a uh, like, like Melissa is, is one person who would go out with us to speak with the victims, and we also have um, numerous uh, victim specialists, as well as when we interview children, especially agents don't uh, interview actual minors, we have what's called a, adolescent, a child adolescent forensic interviewer who specializes in the interviews of those. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not the best uh, person, you know, a large white man going in to speak to a, a you know, a six, eight year old girl about something she did online. So we have special um, pe people that specialize in those kind of conversations as well. Thank you. Uh, victim specialist Nelvada, could you please explain to the audience what is the role of a victim specialist with the FBI? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, thank you to the Chaldean Community Foundation as well. This is an important topic and a, a relevant vital one. And thank you to all of you who have tuned in. Um, I, I, I want to say that because there's freedom and truth and power when we, when we talk about things like this, so I applaud everyone for engaging. So as a victim specialist, I work alongside um, Special Agent Christensen, among other agents, and as he mentioned, we have other specialists across the, uh, the area, and we are there to support the primary victim, that uh, young person who was exploited, as well as any support system, uh, family, guardian, and whatnot. We initially, we can be there when they come in for their first uh, meeting with law enforcement. We like to take what's called a victim 
victim-centered or survivor-centered approach, we can accommodate and accompany uh, and meet the juvenile at uh, with one of our offices, a designated space. Uh, there are ch uh, children's advocacy centers also. Um, as uh, Special Agent Christensen noted, we have specific individuals who are very skilled and trained um, to conduct a child's forensic interview. Because again, we go to that victim-centered approach. The, the topic is very uh, detailed. It can, uh, we don't wanna cause any further harm to that child. So it's important to have that support on scene. We share with them what their, their rights are as victims for this crime. We provide connections and resources or referrals to those in the local community. And I'm so happy to learn of the, the one that we are here today. Uh, they have a multitude of services as um, Jackie next to me will be talking about. Because in this crime, we also, also give them opportunity to share what type of uh, notice they would want, a preference as far as should these images be uh, continue to be exposed or found, do they want to be notified? How do they want to be notified? And then with this crime, um, we, you know, there are short-term and long-term uh, effects, and um, Dr. Jackie will speak of that. But we, we just make sure we're there for them in the beginning, middle, and through the end. And it, should the case go forward, we also uh, make sure to provide support um, up, have, you know, up until indictment. How can a family support the victim? How can a family support the victim? That's a critical question because, you know, it's extortion or anything with the exploitation of a child that involves a uh, risque, as Adam had mentioned, picture, something of a nude picture, that's taboo um, in a lot of different communities, cultures especially. And that's why I'm so proud and happy to be here today because supporting a victim means doing so in a compassionate, patient, non-judgmental way. This victim has done nothing wrong. They are not the one who has broken the law. A lot of the times there is what, the, it's a cycle of victimization. So as um, Agent Christensen noted very, very well that the, it, one or two images may be exposed initially or shared, and then it becomes a dark hole or web into other things and so, as this uh, cycle or spider web, so to speak, continues, that child is hard to come forward. There's a lot of fear as well. They don't want to be judged. Again, they don't want to be blamed. So they not only have fear of coming forward, maybe and sharing it with law enforcement, although that is a, one of the that is the best thing to do. There's fear, perhaps, by the uh, offender, because that offender will say, if you don't give me more images or other videos, I then will release this to all of your friends online, all of your friends on Facebook or other social media. And there's also fear of shame and, and maybe within a family, within a community, because they feel that they might be blamed. So in having these types of discussions and bringing awareness, again, we, we can support that victim in saying, this is not your fault, you didn't do anything wrong, and in sharing that, uh, the truth, you, you can reach that point of freedom. And we're here to support you in that. Thank you so much for that information. Uh, Jackie Raster, what are some of the behavioral changes parents might notice if their child is being targeted online? Well, depending on a, a child or teen's developmental level and age, um, <laughs> You're, they could express themselves in different ways, and very often it's in a behavioral uh, manner. When you look at the stigma that we often uh, place around mental health services to start, if a individual hasn't uh, experienced that, that's okay. Or, you know, there's times when, when all of us, it's okay to not be okay. And when you're dealing with something uh, that a child or a teen is experiencing, they may not want to talk to a parent or an educator or a trusted adult about emotional struggles and challenges related to either technology harassment, usage, or victimization because they have these feelings of shame and because they might not be aware that they're being exploited to start with until it's, it starts to 
they bring shame on themselves or feel guilt. They may also be worried that their privileges are going to be taken away. So they don't want to tell anyone um, about what I'm using or doing on my phone because I might not have access to my device anymore. So parents really, and uh, guardians, trusted adults, I would really encourage to start those conversations very early on and continually dialogue with your children and your teens based on you know, their developmental level uh, about boundaries about usage and responsible usage of um, devices, whether that be their telephone or their, the internet, and stay involved with what they're doing. So, uh, uh, like someone mentioned earlier, uh, it's, the kids have been exposed to this a lot earlier than a lot of our adults. So you need to um, stay on top of what's going on with them. Whenever you see uh, a child being victimized, or hear of a child being victimized, it can be really difficult to spot what's going on because the perpetrators take such drastic steps to hide their actions. And it's important that we don't allow shame, blame, or stigma to complicate the recovery because that's one of the biggest barriers to recovery in any mental health situation. If you have severe, long-lasting cyberbullying or victimization, it can lead to anxiety, depression, and other stress-related disorders. So keep talking to your children in age-appropriate ways and be an active listener. If they know that they can come to you with a small challenge, they're more than likely to be open when they have a bigger distress because they know that you, that you care and, and, and you, you're there and they can come to you when they're distressed. You might see physical warning signs if someone's actually been um, physically approached and that can sometimes be a red flag that you might want to um, notice, you might notice trauma to genital area, unexplained bleeding or bruising. Emotional changes could include eating habits that change, mood, personality changes, uh, maybe increased aggression at home or decreased self-confidence excessive worry, an increase in um, unexplained health concerns. A lot of times um, when we don't have the verbiage to explain what's going on, it feels physical to us. So it might be complaints of stomach aches or headaches, um, not wanting to kind of spend time anymore in typical activities. It's, it's often about change or being afraid to be alone um, at night, evidencing self-harm behaviors, Behavioral warning signs could include excessive talking about or knowledge of sexual topics that doesn't seem appropriate for the individual's age. Um, keeping secrets. Uh, I think it's a good idea to talk with children right away about what a secret is and what that means and when, you know, um, it, it's not appropriate to keep secrets. Not wanting to be left alone with certain people or being afraid to be away from a primary caregiver can also be a red flag, especially if it's a new behavior. Regressive behaviors such as uh, bedwetting, thumb sucking could also be a concern if they're um, going back to behaviors that they'd outgrown at one time. Also, a uh, concern about removing clothing to change or to bathe can be uh, a concern as to why all of a sudden there's that you know, hypervigilance that might, might not have been there before. Uh, inappropriate sexual behavior for a child at any age or being overly compliant or withdrawn can also be some concerns that uh, you might want to look out for. I think that parents and trusted guardians are often experts. You know, they're the experts on their individual child and we all express ourselves emotionally and behaviorally in different ways. So being attuned to your child and what's typical for them. And uh, don't be um, hesitant to ask questions, to get involved, and let them know that no question is a bad question or a dumb question. You're there to support them. Um, at the Chaldean Community Foundation, we're very um, fortunate to have a trilingual Arabic, Chaldean, and English-speaking licensed social workers. And they're here accessible to Michigan residents and um, children ages 13 years and up, regardless of insurance. So we're available and, and can provide private consultation because this is, uh, the child is a victim, 
in this situation, but the family also experiences a lot of distress as well. So we would welcome you to contact us if you have concerns. Uh, of course, you know, you want to uh, manage things with law enforcement uh, right off the bat, and they have, it sounds like a great program to support victims and families. But as uh, situation progresses and other distress or concerns, whether it be uh, the parents or, or the children, we're here to offer those services. Thank you so much for all of that information. I'm sure parents can find that resource very valuable if needed. Um, what can a parent do to encourage their child to come forth? Are there any words or suggestions that we might um, be able to provide that would help with um, getting the information out of the child? I think really just being an active listener uh, right from the get-go. Um, you want to be involved with your children from, from day one so they know that they can come to you with any kind of conversation um, that's distressing them. And picking up when you notice something's going on, letting them know that you care. They're very perceptive. Uh, generally, um, kids that become victims, uh, from my understanding, is they have a vulnerability. So they need to have that trust in, in a, a trusted adult and know that that they can come to you and talk to you. Avoiding shame and avoiding stigma is, is a big part of this because they are victims. Special Agent Christensen, do you know how many cases of sex extortion have reported to the FBI? I, I don't offhand. I, I know it's been increasing over the time period that I've been working in this area, but um, you know, I we, we get at least a few just locally here in Wayne County uh, or the local police report kind of just every year. Um, so, you know, it has to be in an order of thousands going on throughout the nation. Detective Pappas, what are you seeing in your office? Um, locally, we are, like I said earlier, seeing an increase um, in those cases specifically. Um, but I would probably say we get active cases monthly um, from our residents. And so that's obviously concerning. Time, we're going to take some questions that have come through um, Facebook chat. Yes, I do have a question. Um, this is a question from a uh, student. Uh, they said, when you friend someone online, how much of or how much access do they have to your information, personal information? I don't know. Yeah. I think it's going to be very dependent on what application you're, you're using as far as that goes. Um, so some like Facebook allow kind of settings to be changed to determine what can be shown and what isn't shown to, to, to friends. Um, but in general, it, when you friend somebody on an application, they're going to have access to your entire profile. So whatever you choose to put on the profile is going to be open and accessible to the people that uh, you choose to add as friends. So depending on um, your comfort level uh, and your age, you may want to think about whether you want to be adding friends that the people that you don't know in outside of the real world or in real life is physical. <laughs> okay, another question is um, when a person is, um, when they're going on to different websites and they put in their age and they don't put in an appropriate age because they're not old enough, um, is there a difference between under age 18 or over age 18 um, in monitoring some of those? I don't. Again, it's, it's depending on the application you're using. Um, so uh, in the United States, we have the COPPA, the Child Online Protection Act, which uh, basically says that uh, companies have to be very protective of anyone under the age of 13. Um, and that basically makes, that, that's where those rules stem from. So if you are 13 or under, uh, many of the uh, companies don't want to deal with that information. And so they effectively say that you have to be above that age uh, to use applications, which just means that many uh, people choose to lie about how old they are to get on to that. So uh, there are some, I think, specific applications that are targeted to teenagers, um, where you're supposed to uh, be between the ages of 13 and 19, 13, 18, something like that. 
um, and they you know they try to be protective and um, again it's all dependent on, on kind of the application you're looking at. Okay, another question is uh, game sy system have a way to report uh, bad language or bad behavior and often kids will say I got kicked out for a couple of days. Is that true of uh, some of the applications? Is there a place where parents or children can report online like the game system? Yeah, so uh, most applications have a reporting tool either uh, directly in the application itself like you can, you can block users uh, that are being uh, uh, negative to you or threatening. Um, in different applications, there's also reporting uh, the, either directly in the application, or uh, many app, uh, smartphone applications have, if you can get their website, they'll have an email address that you can report uh, behavior to. But uh, in these kind of situations where you're looking at someone uh, involved in sextortion, that they are going to um, threaten you to, to get these images from you, they're just gonna create another account and uh, come at you from a different direction. So, you know, the, like I said earlier, the, the, really the only way to short circuit it is to tell a trusted adult uh, to get out of it uh, because these guys are very uh, persistent uh, in, in what they want and will do anything they think, especially if they think they're hidden, they'll do anything they want to, to get it. Okay, um, and this question um, is um, for Detective Pappas. Uh, so this is a local person that's asking, if a child, if um, two consented, let's say their boyfriend, girlfriend, and uh, they decide to send inappropriate pictures to each other, uh, and the boyfriend or girlfriend shares it, uh, so the parent wants to sue or do something uh, to the person that shared it, do both of the both of the kids get in trouble, or only the child that shares the picture? Um, uh, that's a great question. I, I will say that um, technically, the sharing of a new photo of a minor, whether it be by way of them taking it themselves and sharing it, um, or them accepting a photo that is nude of a minor, it is still considered child pornography. Um, now, the way the prosecutor's office typically views a situation like that um, is that a victim in it uh, where their images were shared with people that they did not consent it to be shared to, um, they don't typically view them as spreading child pornography. Um, they're viewed as an actual victim. But that is absolutely something that we will prosecute. Um, and there's a specific charge for uh, what we consider to be a revenge type of texting um, of someone's nude photos. Okay. Uh, another question is, this is for uh, WCS. Um, now that you have uh, online learning, uh, some of the parents uh, are seeing that you have certain passwords and different different uh, ways that you're protecting the students from downloading certain websites and apps and to keep them away. Um, and so they were asking um, how they actually can do that on their personal computers and, uh, and have that been controlled with all the kids' computers. Uh, specifically uh, on how they can control their own computer? Yes, on, on some of the items that you have installed on the computers you've given them? Uh, they, they sign an agreement uh, and they're given passwords and the parents are part of that. So the parents are the ones actually set it up for their, for their children. So if, if they haven't done that, uh, they can go on our website and we have information on that, how they can get those forms to, to make sure that they have the access to it. Because sometimes the, the, the kids will go on, they find it'll go around. And like we said, um, these youngsters are less far enough sometimes when it comes to using these tools. Um, they try and go around and then mom and dad can't get in to see what they're doing kind of thing. And, um, so yeah, I, I recommend basically going on the website and uh, there's an issue with it. There's a form you can fill out so you can make sure that you have the, the master password to, uh, to have access. What happens if a child violates the technology agreement with the school system? Uh, we have various policies in place uh, depending on what, what, they, what they've done. Um, the policies can range from anywhere from, uh, from being uh, suspended or being taken out of class for a few days to, uh, depending on the, uh, on the severity of it, it's up to expulsion. Um, so what you do online, uh, in a classroom online, is the same, is considered the same thing you do in person. So when you're on class online and you, you say something inappropriate, show something inappropriate, do something inappropriate, 
the penalties are the same as if you were in that classroom, so they're not any different. You're, you can't hide from it. Okay, and um, so someone was asking how do predators um, they were crooks or con artists uh, find victims online? Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, they, they, they're going to, they're using social media effectively. So they are going to sites that they know um, children frequent um, and they're going to uh, communicate through channels, ch channels there. So they're going to, often they look for behaviors that they can identify as someone who may be even more vulnerable than just being a child, um, or whether they're, you know, like, like I said earlier, just don't have as many friends uh, in real life, or they uh, seem to be depressed, or uh, anything they can find to get a hook. Um, but they're using the same sites and games and applications that the children are going to, and you know, potentially pretending to be a child themselves to kind of befriend the, the victims. And then the second part to that question is, what is the most um, dangerous time to be online for a student being targeted? Uh, I mean, so, you know, in, in the, I, I don't know if there's a particular time during the day, uh, you know, a lot of people work, so, you know, they, they'll, they'll get active in the evening, but with a lot of these guys, this is, this is their full-time job. Uh, they're, they're every waking moment they have in their life. On trying to trying to get this stuff, um, so I I would say that you know you can't really choose a time of day that's better or worse uh, for for being uh, targeted. And then uh, one parent used the word cyberbullying. So do you find that um, perhaps uh, I don't know if the school district is having a problem with that or locally with cyberbullying? I'll let you first. Oh. Well, yeah, certainly, you know, there's always, um, we have children uh, making poor, you know, poor driving errors when they're online, and they use that, the, the vehicle of the internet uh, to, to, to strike back at somebody. Um, we do see a lot of that. Um, we, we, in Warren County, we try to make uh, the person, uh, person responsible for what they say and do on, online. And, and we work in conjunction with the Certain Heights Police Department and the Warren Police Department. Um, and we don't, uh, we have a zero tolerance for that, um, where we, uh, we, we uh, work very closely with them. And I think it's pretty much known that we, uh, they think it's a minor kind of thing, um, but we do have to involve the police, take reports and have them follow up. Uh, it doesn't always, always necessarily mean they're gonna be prosecuted, but we wanna make sure that our, our community is protected and we go through all the resources we have to, to make sure they are protected. Uh, and just to caveat that real quick, uh, thanks Rick. Um, I would say to um, anyone out there, or our residents specifically, that if your child is a victim of cyberbullying, um, as it was mentioned before, to save everything, um, that's, that's our evidence. That's what we'd like to see when we're pushing forward through prosecution. Um, in the state of Michigan, our prosecutor's office, we will prosecute a child 10 years of age and up. I know that's kind of an alarming age, um, but we will do it. Um, there is a specific crime for cyberbullying that we will pursue. Um, but again, it's really important that we have all of those items, um, screenshots, emails, any type of messaging on any of the apps where that uh, type of communication happened so that we can properly assess it um, and hopefully push for prosecution. If not, we do work in conjunction with the school and find it very helpful that if prosecution cannot be met, that the school will do some type of um, action if they can um, as far as discipline within the school. Um, I'd like to direct, uh, based on those um, remarks, I'd like to direct a question to Melissa and Jackie. And that is, what are the long-term ramifications for a child when help is not given to them at a young age, when you're a victim of either uh, bullying, um, sexual exploitation, or extortion? Lack of treatment in any kind of uh, mental health disorder is not a good way to go. So if you if you've uh, been under such distress or stress, uh, being a victim or a, a, for any other reason, um, and you continue to kind of 
avoid receiving services or getting the kind of support, generally symptomology becomes worse and it can be more difficult to recover from. So I really encourage um, people not to let stigma or shame get in the way. Uh, it's just as important to take care of your mental health as it is your physical health. So um, talking with someone uh, about the kind of services available and getting the support is really important as, as soon as possible. And if I may, Mary, I would just add, it, it can then become a gateway into maybe some other activities. Um, and then, you know, also how do I cope with that? Maybe in using substances, maybe in finding comfort or connection to, as Adam had mentioned um, uh, online, that these people will prey upon you. So in doing that, there's something called a trauma bond. And so uh, if, if, there, if the web becomes darker and deeper, and you know it, it digresses more. So, if we don't address it at that at that point, again, just be um, trusting, be open, and and be a, a entry point for them to come to you. I see our time. So, go on. Oh, there was a lot of really valuable information, and um, I want you to know that there are resources available for families if their child has been victimized online. You can, of course, reach out to the FBI, 1-800-CALL-FBI. You can reach out to the local um, police department if it's, um, you know, uh, something that you're more comfortable doing. Or, you know, a child needs to reach out to a trusted adult. We are here for you. There are services available for parents um, to help cope. It's, it's a, a lot on a family, and we understand that um, sometimes there's a stigma that perhaps shame may be greater than the um, actual act and, and it is definitely not the case and we hope that parents do reach out to get the assistance that their child needs. You can also find information on sex extortion by visiting the FBI website at www.fbi.gov. Um, you can also reach out to our local office if you um, would like uh, additional information at 313-965-2323 and please ask to speak to Community Outreach and um, I will try to provide you with additional information. With that, I'd like to turn the program back over to Paul Jenna. Uh, first, we really uh, want to thank all of our panelists for being here for Warren Consolidated School, Serving Heights Police Department, FBI Detroit Field Office, Jackie. A uh, special thank you to Mary, you've done a phenomenal job with this. I know this has been very special to the Bureau as well as you. Uh, it's an important topic. Uh, it's something that we want to make sure that we're having the conversation. And I think the biggest takeaway is to have an open, honest communication with everybody that's involved. Um, Kelvin Foundation is here for any help that you need. Everybody is welcome, regardless of uh, who you are, where you're at. Our doors are open. 586-722-7253 uh, or KelvinFoundation.org. You can walk up to the door. We can uh, service you that way. Uh, we have phenomenal partners that are here for, to help in any way possible as well. I want to thank you all. Uh, continue to stay vigilant. Continue to have open discussions. Thank you all. Thank you.